Okay. Okay, good afternoon. So my presentation is going to be related to this subject, which is the main uh, line of research in, in, in my group. Um, so this is uh, making the power system dynamics uh, better. So by improving these, then the system will be able to uh, accept more renewable energy in the, in the future. Renewable energy, maybe 20 years ago, was uh, not a big concern. Many people did not believe in, for example, uh, wind energy or solar energy. But uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, there were some important changes in the country. And little by little, the percentage of uh, renewable energy in the system in the United States started increasing importantly. Today, for example, wind energy is more important than hydro generation in, in the US. And, and, and solar energy very soon will also uh, surpass hydro generation. We're easily more than 10% of uh, the total generation in the country is easily more than 10% related to um, non-conventional renewable energy, meaning um, mainly wind energy and solar energy. So what I'm going to do uh, this afternoon, I'm going to talk briefly about the thing that we have done in my group to improve the dynamics and, and prepare the grid for increased levels of renewable energy. So at the beginning, I'm going to make a description of the power system, and then I'm going to talk about the enhancement, the, the, the different things that we have proposed uh, for improving the operation of power systems. My current student, these are my three current students working for her uh, PhD degree. And these are my, my four former students. Uh, two of them graduated with a PhD and two of them with a master in, in electrical engineering. So there is a question here. Okay. You cannot see the slide. Okay. Um, let's fix this problem. Uh, I'm able to see the slides. You can see it. Okay. Um, yeah, a lot of people are saying they can. Uh, if they're on mobile, they may have to change it from speaker view to shared screen, but the rest of us can see the slides. Okay. Perfect. If you need help to, to see the, the slides, uh, please put your comment, comments in the chat uh, window. And maybe Mirka, you, you can help them. So, <clears throat> power system description. So, probably you have already heard about the information of power systems so far in, in the program. But here I'm going to uh, describe a few key characteristics. Um, in this uh, slide, I, I have the, the energy flow in the United States in 2018. Um, this has changed a little bit in, in the last uh, three years, but let's use 2018 as a reference. So here you have, from the left, you have primary energy sources. And the, the arrows, uh, or these lines here, the width of this is proportional to the amount of energy we are using from that primary energy. As you can see on the green, at the bottom is petroleum. So that's a, a very thick, that the meaning of that is that we're using an important amount of all the energy consumption in the country come from petroleum. And then as you move to the right, then you can see how these primary energies being used. On the, on the very right, you, you see, uh, also you see this uh, dark gray and light gray. The dark gray is the, the energy service, the uses of energy. And the light uh, gray means the energy that we have not used. And that is called the rejected energy. As you can see, uh, an important amount of this is light gray, meaning that's energy that is mainly transformed into heat 
in all these processes transforming into heat that go to the atmosphere and we cannot recover. And that's typical of a thermal system. You know, a thermal system in general, they might have a 30% of usage and then the 70% is releasing heat that go to the atmosphere and we cannot recover. So it's still, you can see that in, 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 the, in the country in general, meaning that uh, our uh, therm and thermal process most, most of the time is uh, related to the use of uh, petroleum and coal, uh, natural gas. So all, all these, uh, uh, we're using importantly this type of uh, primary energy and therefore the usage of energy is not significant. But as we move uh, uh, to a different mix and, and we start using more renewable energy, this uh, percentage can change in the future. Now, this is all the energy usage, but as you can see in the middle of this uh, diagram, you see an orange block here, which is related to the electricity. This is the power system, actually, this uh, rectangle here. And as you can see, the, 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 the power grid use uh, mainly all this type of uh, energy source, as you can see. An important one is coal. And in, in the past, like uh, let's say 20 years ago, this was much uh, bigger. The system was mainly thermal and we use most of the energy came from coal. And then we have natural gas with an important fraction of this uh, providing generation in the power grid. And you have nuclear that is also a thermal process, but use radioactive material. And then you have hydro with, uh, with some fraction, wind. And as I mentioned, you, you see the numbers here. The number for wind is still below, but this was 2018. Today, wind is much significant than hydro. And solar has a very small percentage, but this is comparable to hydro, hydro today. So in the last three uh, years, this has changed and renewables is in, uh, the use of renewable energy has been increased in the system. Okay, so that, that's the situation and what we expect for the ne next 10 and 20 years that this will continue. Renewable energy will be an important part of the generation mix in the power grid. So how this is started for the power grid? This is started more than a century uh, ago and we have these two big uh, uh, scientists on one side, we have Thomas Edison, and the other, we have Nikola Tesla. The, 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 the key part of, of their work for the power grid is that Nick, Thomas Edison worked on the development of DC system. These use signals of current and voltage that are continuous. But Nikola Tesla developed the AC system in which the signals for voltage and current are sinusoidal. So the bottom line of this story is that um, Nikola Tesla, uh, the development of Nikola Tesla was very good, effective and efficient because it was very uh, easy to control AC signal at the time. Uh, the equipment that we needed to develop the AC system was simple to build and less expensive than the DC side. So because of that work, the grid started uh, growing and it was built around the AC system. Still, we use the C system for very specific application, but, but the main, main, um, main operation of the C system is based on AC system. Um, then this is a picture, a, a description of the development of uh, electrical system. And, and this is uh, more than a century ago. And you can see that in red, the AC system, the development. These were mainly, all of these were mainly uh, the system to energize uh, the, the electrical components in a city, a small town. They use it for, for for equipment and also for, for public uh, lights. 
Um, and you can see also DC development in the uh, yellow color here, but most of them were AC. But with the AC, uh, because AC was from the technical point of view, has advantage of that we can transport electricity over long distance without an excessive cost. Uh, very soon after the development of the, the initial grid, the, these independent interconnection in all the cities start getting interconnected because that will incre uh, increase at that time the reliability. So if you didn't have your local system working for your town the, because you have some lack of um, a primary energy to run your generators or some failures through transmission line, you can energize your town with electricity coming from other uh, nearby towns. So the interconnection was possible because of the AC development of Nikola Tesla. And this is a picture of what we have today in the United States. And as you can see, it's a very big system uh, and interconnected in many different ways. It's, it's, uh, first of all, it's very large. This system is all connected. So this is one of the most, uh, the, the largest engineer system created by humankind. And we have uh, millions of components, easily millions of components with generators, also consumers, lines, transformers, and many other equipment that are needed for the proper operation of this system. But uh, the system also is not just large, but also is uncertain. There are things that can happen and we don't know when and how they will happen. Um, and these are related to failures, maybe with the weather, related to weather conditions, or might be related to human errors that might create some uh, accident and that might affect the operation of the system but also can be related to normal patterns of consumption. For example, we use electricity in a variable fashion during the day. So at home, in my house, for, for example, I have minimal consumption now because there is nobody there. But when I arrive, probably will start using the components and the consumption uh, will increase in my house. And that is variable during the day and during a week. So that uh, changes in the power consumption also affect the operation of the grid. Um, luckily, luckily, we, engineers has been able to, to design a system that can handle very well those changes in the consumption. But we have um, in, in the last decades, significant increase in the renewable energy. And that can be more unpredictable. Um, so uncertain because uh, predicting the, the, the intensity of wind can be problematic. It's not easy sometimes. There are good techniques based on physical model that can provide a good, a good estimate, but there is some uncertainty there. Also with solar generation, specifically with PV panels, for example, it's very uncertain when you have um, uh, a cloudy day and, 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 and you have clouds going in the sky that can provide some shading over the panels, then the production of power will be very variable. So those are uncertain situations. So we need to deal with this large system and with some uncertainty. We don't know if there is a failure or changes in the generation or changes in the consumption. So that makes uh, the system very complex as well. Why it's so complex? Because the system is very particular. We call it a synchronized system. Synchronized mean that the frequency in all points, no matter whether you are in the East Coast or West Coast, um, they should operate with the same frequency. And that's very complex. And, and, and it be, because it's a synchronized system, if there is a failure, even far away, let's say you're, you're in Florida and there is a failure that might affect any part of the system. 
So that, that failure can be propagated over the grid because it's a synchronized system. They all respond at the same time. So here we are dealing with a giant system that is uncertain and is complex. So what is our role, the, the role of the, the, my, my, my research line and that I work with my PhD student is how we can make this large system that is uncertain and complex more robust. So even if there are failures, how the system can respond in a favorable way. And if, if the system is more robust, then a natural outcome of that is that the system will be able to handle more renewable energy in the future. So far, is, is there any question? If you have questions, you can uh, use the microphone or also you can use the chat windows to to ask your question. And I will do my best to answer any question you might have. So with this description of the system, you know, there are situations that occur and, and uh, probably, probably uh, you, you are not aware of this, but uh, one of the largest issues we have in the United States was in 2003. This was just two years after the the terrorist attack to the Twin Towers in 2001. And what happened, the outcome is that more than 50 million people were without energy. Some of them for several hours, some of them for two days without electricity. And without electricity, everything is shut down. We don't have the capability to do anything. Traffic light do not work. Uh, this office that I'm uh, giving this talk to you, I cannot do it without electricity. Computers doesn't work. And if I am uh, in a very tall building, then I am forced to use the stairs, uh, elevators will not work. And that happened, imagine the situation in New York City, very congested area, a lot of people, and all of a sudden, the city was without electricity. People were, were trapped in the, uh, buildings and the streets also, a huge traffic jam. People could not uh, leave the, the island easily and they were very nervous, especially because this was just two years after the Twin, attack, the twin Tower attack. So um, that was very problematic. Um, what happened there? Well, the system was very operating at a very high load level at that day. It was a day in summer, very hot, and some failure in the in the mid part of the country uh, lead to all these problems. Very hard to anticipate, of course. And one of the things that happened that maybe triggered the whole problem was a branch of a tree falling in a transmission line that created a short circuit. That seems so simple but the system was operating in such a vulnerable operating point that even that simple issue created this uh, tremendous problem. This caused a lot of uh, public concern and because of security, but also created a cost, economical cost, because you stop producing, you st stop uh, if you have a factory, you stop producing your product and that has an economical impact. If, if you are the store, for example, of a supermarket, if you don't have backup generation, then your product will get uh, spoiled and then that's a loss. So this is something that we need to prevent. And, and, and the line of research that I, I, I have is how we can prevent this scenario by making the grid robust. So even if that happened, what can we do so, so the system can withstand this type of situation? Uh, a key aspect I said that is the, the frequency. The system is a synchronized system. Frequency when everything is in a steady state should be the same anywhere in the country. But uh, in a transient state, when we have changes, 
then the frequency in different points can deviate from the steady state values. And, and there, uh, a simple rule that we can consider for what happened in the transient state is what I have here in this equation. So the energy uh, generated must be equal to the energy consumed plus the er energy, the changes in the kinetic energy stored in the masses of the power plants. Power plants, uh, mainly the traditional one, so we're talking about steam power plants, uh, thermal power plant in general, or hydro power plant. These are very massive components. They have a rotor in the generator. These are very heavy and they, they're attached to a big turbine. So they are very heavy. So when the machines are operating and rotating, because of the inertia, they keep rotating at a steady speed. And that's the speed related to the frequency in the system. Everything is steady and they are so heavy and that's good. Uh, because even when you have this failure, the speed will not change in the machine significantly. So everything is, is smooth. But if, if, if the masses of this power plant are not large enough, then the inertia will be less. And then if the inertia is less, then this disturbance in the system can create changes in the speed. So that can be problematic. Inertia is a key aspect. So today we're thinking about that the grid will change in the next 10, 20 years using renewable energy. Just imagine the case of solar panels. So if solar panels increase in the system, those are not mechanical system like the one that I am describing. So a mechanical system will rotate. There are heavy masses rot uh, rotating in a shaft and that's the, 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 the main component of uh, generators. And um, intrinsically, you have energy store, kinetic energy store, and you have an inertia, and that will keep the speed of this machine. But if you have solar panels, intrinsically, you don't have any, any storage uh, of energy in those so solar panels. If all of the sudden you don't, you have a big cloud in front of your solar panel, the, the power will go down and you don't have any storage of energy. So that's, that's a, a, a problem for the grid because in the future, if instead of using a conventional power plant, we use solar panels, then the issue with that, the, the one thing is positive, we will use renewable energy and then we'll avoid polluting, uh, for example, locally because of, of the, the, the fumes that come from the power plant will not affect the, the population living close to that power plant. That's positive. But the negative thing is that it, instead of using that conventional power plant, we use solar panels, then the system will not gain inertia. You will, you will not get energy stored in the system. And if the inertia is less in the system, then um, during this disturbance in the system, the frequency might deviate more. So here is a plot. Um, you have uh, here, this is a measurement in a small country in South America. Uh, you have the frequency, the nominal frequency should be 50 Hertz there, but this is how it's changing uh, in, a, in some period of time. And you see significant changes because the system is small. Just as a comparison, here we have the same frequency plot in black from that small country in Chile. And I compare that frequency with a very large country, uh, China, which is in red. And you see because China is much larger and you have conventional power plants that are more significant, you have more energy store than the changes in the frequency are less. So as the system moves to higher percentage of renewable energy, one concern is that the frequency in the system might start deviating more. And that might, might cause some problems in the operation. So what do we do to prevent those things? So that's uh, 
a research aspect and a research line and, and, and finding a solution to the problem can make the system uh, better prepared to receive more penetration of renewable energy. In the old times, uh, you can see in the picture what was the control room of uh, part of a power grid. And you can see most of these was used anal analog equipment. But today, a uh, uh, power system control room look more like this, a modern control room. So here in this uh, center, you can see uh, information in real time you have information from key components in the system you're taking measurements and you can control also remotely some components from here but um, there is a still one 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 hard part which is you have a lot a lot of data coming from different points i show you how how the grid it is just cover all the country so it's very large so the components easily you have more than several millions of components and, and in this control room you you will have a lot of data and and, and the, the the difficult part is here okay so how we process all this data and how do we know what is the state of the system so there is a key critical aspect here is uh, how we extract useful information from this information that can be used by the operators to uh, respond to this uh, disturbance, for example, if there is a disturbance, how we take the best decision, how we will control the system, given all this huge amount of information we'll receive. So that's an another uh, critical thing that we're dealing with. Now, that's the description of the, the power system. Now let me make a, a jump into what I do exactly, what we do with my PhD student. And this is related to the power system dynamics enhancement, how we can make the system respond better when there are these disturbance and respond in a dynamic fashion that is very robust. So that's what, what I'm going to talk now. But before doing that, we need to think about what is a dynamic system. And, and I don't know, I would like to ask uh, you if any of you have some comments on this aspect. What, what is a dynamic system? How would you define a dynamic system? <clears throat> and probably you, you study this in, in in first or second years in the in your engineering program. Um, and one way to define this is in a mathematical fashion. You say, well, a dy dynamic system is a system that can be described by differential equations. But that might be one definition. But um, uh, even though that that's true from the mathematical point of view, I would like to give you a more practical definition. So dynamic system is, is a system that, that uh, has a system that in, is involved with energy stored in their components. So if you have energy storage in your system in any form, that will define a dynamic system. Why? Because by the law of physics, any energy cannot be created or destroyed energy need to be transformed and, 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 and that cannot be, need to take some time to make that transformation. So you have uh, an energy system that will take some form of energy and over time that will evolve into some other form of energy that takes time. So um, for example, the speed, an example is a car. So if you have a a car, for example, that's a dynamic system. What kind of energy you have? Well, if, if you're in a flat area, the energy you have there is just kinetic energy. You're at a given speed. And to put that car in that speed, you need some energy that comes from fuel and that, that through the engine will apply some force and, and, and your car will, will start moving. But that car will have some 
kinetic energy store related to the mass of that car and the speed at which you are going. So if you're on the highway and you're at 60 miles per hour, well, it's impossible that in a fraction of a second, you will jump from 60 to 70 because it's a dynamic system. It takes time to increase the speed because you have energy. And, and in the same way, if there are something that is happening in your way, the speed of that car will also will take time to respond and will respond to the highway you're driving. Uh, so let, let's imagine for a moment, you're at a constant speed and all of a sudden you're going up on a hill. So what do you think that will happen to your car? So if you're going at 60 miles per second per, per, per hour and, and the car is going uphill and, 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 and you don't press the, 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 the gas pedal and, and what will happen is that your car will keep going uphill, but the speed will start going down. So the way to correct that, and that will not happen immediately, is that you start pressing more the, the gas pedal. So then you will have more power. And if you wanna go at constant speed, then you need to apply more power. So the action that you take pressing the pedal will not have an immediate outcome. It will need some time to, to, for the car to acquire the speed that you want. So that's a dynamic system. You take action, but the, action, the effect of those actions do not happen immediately. And, and, and you need to know your car. This is a small car, heavy car, that will have some impact on what is the action you will have and, and the outcome you will have. So, so uh, that's, that's a dynamic system. Another dynamic system might be this kite. So you have, an, in the same fashion than in the car, you have a highway and the elevation of the highway, whether you're in a flat area, you're going up or downhill, the, the, that's the input. Then the, the kite might have an input and that's the wind. The wind can blow more stronger or less stronger in, and that will have an effect on the kite. And you have a goal. Maybe the goal for the car was going at constant speed well, the, the goal here in the kite might be, well, we want to keep it steady and maybe high up and no matter what is the, the speed you have, but the wind will change and depending on the configuration of your kite, how big it is, the shape that you have, where you put the, the cord in the kite that will have an effect, well, then your kite will behave in different fashion. So I play uh, many times with kites when I was a kid and the most difficult part was how we can make the kite stable. Sometimes uh, depending on the kite, of course, the size, the shape and, and, and how we put the cord in the kite, then sometimes the, the kite was moving in irregular fashion and that was not very fortunate for, for, for me as a child. But a simple solution for, for me at that time was to put a tail. The longer the tail, the better for stability. The kite all of the sudden stopped moving in an irregular fashion and it was more steady, stable. The, 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 the negative side of that though, that I couldn't put any tail that I want. I wanted to put a very long tail, but as longer the tail was, the, the heavier the kite became and uh, the, the kite was not easily uh, going up in the sky. So that was the, 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 the problem with that. But a solution for this, you, you see, we have a system and, and your goal was to keep the system stable. Then the action to make this, this kite stable was simple, simply putting a tail at the bottom of the kite. Now improve the, the, the dynamic response of that guy. Well, those are examples. And, and, and for the power grid, it's way more complicated because of what I mentioned before, you have a very large system. You have millions of components. And it's complex because 
the, the component in the power grid, they are all connected. They are all in, in synchronization. So the speed in, in your component should be the same anywhere. And now also is the question, because it's so big, how do you improve this? And another question we need to ask is, what is our goal? What do we want? For the car, it was very easy. For, for example, we, we might like to be at constant speed. Or, and for the kite, was easy too. We want to keep this, the stability of the kite. Now, for the grid, what do we want? Well, the grid, because it's a dynamic system, also it's, it's, uh, it's hard to visualize this because it's not, uh, it's not something we can observe physically because this has to do with the electrical signal, which are invisible. So that's very hard. But these signals in the system will have a dynamic behavior as well. One of the most uh, visible one might be the speed of your generators. As I mentioned, they rotate in a shaft and we want them to rotate always at the same speed in, in a steady fashion, but that will not happen if you have some disturbance. So what we want, for example, in this plot, uh, the frequency to be at 60 Hertz. And if there is a disturbance, the frequency might not be able to be at 60 hertz and the frequency will start deviating. So, but what we want with that frequency that hopefully that frequency come back uh, to a steady point and, and stop being, uh, stop the deviation at some point and stabilize in a new frequency. Hopefully that frequency is very close to 60 hertz, but sometimes that's not possible. And you end up with a frequency that is not 60 hertz, but it will be okay if that frequency is close enough. So that's one problem. Uh, we want that for the power grid to, even if we have disturbance, the frequency should not deviate from 60 Hertz. It's like the car. I said that we want to have the car working, operating at a constant speed, the same for the grid. We want to have the grid with this speed in the machine uh, working at a constant speed as well. Um, one signal that we use from the grid that is proportional to the speed in the machine is electrical frequency, and that is 60 hertz for the whole grid. Another thing you might observe is that when these disturbances happen, you will have oscillation in the system. Oscillation is uh, uh, typically involved with the changes in the kinetic energy stored in these generators. After a disturbance, then some generator might gain speed and start speeding up, increasing the speed. And at the same time, other generators in the system might reduce the speed. So a reduction in the speed means that that generator is injecting more power to the grid and that power is coming from the kinetic energy and that power traveled through the grid and some other generator received that energy and, and increased the speed. But um, the, 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 the intrinsic behavior of this machine is that when this generator decreases speed, some time after that uh, point, the generator will start increasing the speed once again, and this other generator will decrease the speed. So it will be all opposite now. The, the, genera the generator that, that was with a low speed now is higher, and the other that has a higher speed now is low. So you will have this oscillation, this energy going back and forth between these components, gaining and losing the speed. And we want this oscillation at some point to stop because those oscillation can be dangerous for the system. So what do we want for the grid? And I mentioned these two, and there are other goals as well, but these two will be enough uh, for this presentation. So one is we want to keep the frequency very close to 60 Hertz, even if there are disturbance. And another one is we might have this oscillation. And what we want, this oscillation to stop as quick as possible. Um, so this phenomena is going to be phenomena will be related to mainly to the conventional power plants in the system. You might have a steam a turbine, a, a thermal power plant. You might, have, you might have a hydro 
uh, power plant and, and there are very heavy masses rotating in the shaft and those are going to be related with these oscillation problems and frequency excursion. So that's the power grid. But what is the challenge now is that we have higher penetration of renewable energy and that can make these two goals be more uh, challenging to achieve. Probably this oscillation will show up and they will be more significant. And that, that's something we need to solve because with higher penetration, if this problem becomes worse, then we need to come up with new ideas that can control this oscillation. The same thing with the frequency excursion. If with this higher penetration and we have more frequency excursion, then what do we do? How do we design something new in the system that can tackle this problem in a better fashion. So that's the power system, that's a driver, the re renewable energy, and we need to use conventional generation, but today we have also, we can do something with the same renewable energy we're using. They are different, they don't have significant energy store in their operation, but they're very fast and we can use them to help the power grid to have not significant oscillation and not significant frequency excursion today. Another components that we can see in the system are energy storage components. So you, you have batteries, you have flywheels. The problem with these is that the amount of energy they have is not very high in comparison with the energy that the grid needs. So the, mo the most developed one is our batteries, but they are not significant yet for the power grid. The most significant energy storage syst system that we might use for the grid are uh, storing water. Like in a, in a hydro power plant, you have a, a dam. That, that would be the most significant energy store that can be useful in a power system. But those are hard to build. You don't have many locations with those with characteristics that can create a, a store large volumes of water for regulation. Yeah, now that's the description, kind of long description, but now let me go very probably very quickly to the different thing that we have been doing. One of this has to do with the reinforcement. So in the same idea of the kite. Uh, the kite was unstable, then the solution was to put a tail at the bottom of the kite and that would make the kite stable. The same idea can be applied for the power system. And we propose this concept. So, but it's not that easy because the, the system is so large and you have so many components. But the question is, this tail has to do with a controller. So in which part of the system should I put this controller that will uh, provide a huge improvement in the stability in the system. So we came with, with that idea and basically if we have the power system here, we wanted to create some index, some function, something that give us an, a, a value, uh, a value related with the effectiveness of a controller in that point. For example, in this graphical description, if I look at this function, the function will be higher here, meaning that at this point, if I put a controller at this point, then I will have the highest improvement in the operation, in the dynamic operation of the system. But with the same function at this point, the lowest point, that would be the worst point to put a controller. So what we did, uh, we, we handled the, the, the model of the, system and we we develop some analytical uh, uh, properties and, and characteristics that can describe this and this worked very well for linear system here you see this is uh, the north part of Chile which is long so the system is long it's radial and the system at, at the north is connected with our Argentina large country so this was easy. This resembled the kite idea. So the farther away you were from the, the connection to the Argentina, the farther away was the better to put this controller. So that was kind of straightforward, 
but uh, for the operator of that system, that was not it, it was not very clear for them because they deployed some controllers in places in which they did not achieve the highest improvement in the stability for that system. So with this, we proved the concept and it worked very well. The challenge was how we can apply this in a more complicated system with more interconnection, not just radial system like you see in the United States. And that's more challenging. So we call this system mesh system with more interconnection. And so what we did here, uh, I'm going to skip this part that is more mathematical, but basically um, we were proposing a function. So this function with that variable y, y will, is going to be an index that tell you whether a particular location in the system is attractive to deploy a controller or not. And because it, it was more complicated, our, our previous index that, that was on the uh, based on the inertia distribution, I didn't mention that, I'm sorry, in the, in the radial system, so, so when you have a components that are far away from, from the main part of the system, the, the inertia you have in that point is very low. So the, the index was based on the inertia distribution in the system. We wanted to put the controllers in places with low inertia because that would lead to the highest improvement in the stability. In a mesh system, then that's harder. That in, in inertia distribution not always provide the best answer. So we thought, well, there must be other characteristic. And because it's so complex, um, the best thing we could do is to put this in using artificial intelligence. So we pick different characteristic and we try to tie this characteristic with this index of improvement, whether the grid was going to operate better or not. And we let the the algorithm that we develop to pick which are the most important features that we need to pay attention to decide whether a controller will be attractive or not. So we did that. I'm going to skip this mathematical part. And here's a plot of the result. So here uh, in this plot, uh, we, we, we use a, a mathematical objective in, in which we give importance to the number of features that we have. So here at this side of the plot, uh, we put uh, give importance to all the features. So all the features here, basically this is the coefficient, this number that you see here from negative uh, values to positive values was the, the, the weight of that feature. Let me go back to the function, this one. So I am plotting this, uh, this coefficient. So uh, uh, I, am, I am given the weight of those features. Uh, here, we have 36 features and those are the weight. But as I move this parameter in, in my algorithm and I make that parameter larger, then I start discarding some features that are less important. And you, of course, when, when you start discarding feature features, then you, your output is not that accurate. The index that indicate whether a controller in that location is good or not might be inaccurate. So it will be very accurate when you have all the features. But if you start discarding some, some features, you, you will start losing accuracy. At this point in this segmented line, we found that the accuracy was good enough at this point, and we came up with this function. So we use not 36 features, but some of them, some features, and through this equation, we were able to anticipate whether a particular location in the grid was attractive for a controller or not. And I can keep going be beyond this line. And as you can see, the, the last most important feature here, this is the, actually the most important feature. The last one that remains here in this algorithm is exactly the one that we came up for radial system, which is the distribution of inertia. That's very important 
but in a mesh system, there are other characteristics as well we need to consider to determine what is the best location for a controller. So the grid is very complex. So, so, so we need to come up with these ideas to give some answer for improvement. Uh, another one has to do with coordination of controller. The, the grid again is so large and you don't just have one controller. It's not like the kite, your, your controller was the tail of that kite and improve the stability of the kite. It's not just one, the system is so large, you have multiple controllers. And when you have multiple controllers, you need some sort of coordination among them. If you let them all control independently, that might lead to some conflicts. Maybe the use of all these controllers can lead to maybe instabilities, make the system operation worse. So you need some sort of coordination as well. So that's what we, work on these and we provide some answer as well. So this answer was basically based on heavy mathematical models and equations. And we developed some sort of sensitivity to determine whether a controller is good or not for the system operation. And basically the controller decide whether the controller need to be on and off for a given disturbance in operating points. So the, 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 the drawback of this, this is very mathematical. So applying this in, in the real system can be challenging because we need to do all this calculation and we need to do this calculation very quickly. And sometimes we don't have that luxury and we, and we don't have the answer in, in, in time, in a good time. So. What we're working on now is how we can speed up this. And one way that we're using is to use machine learning. So we're trying to come up with a function that is able based on key features of the system, like picking up some variables from the system. Uh, and, and that function should be able to tell us which controller should be op uh, on or off for a particular disturbance in the system. We're currently working on that uh, part of the research. I have a few minutes left. Uh, and and, and one of, the last one that I wanna mention uh, here is discrete control. And this is a recent project that I was awarded at the beginning of the year. And discrete control is important. Most of the design that we have today for the power grid, as are based on continuous control. Uh, and that work very well. But power plants can do that, can follow in a continuous fashion some, some control orders. Um, but some other components are not able to do that. An example, for example, solar panels. Solar panels, because an, a, a, an economical aspect what do we want to do? Given the irradiance of coming from, from the sun, we want to always extract the highest power we can for that irradiance. So that the solar panel will be controlled in that fashion. But when you're working at that maximum power point, then you, you don't have room for, for, for providing any type of control to the grid. So if you're at the maximum power point, how you can provide control from that point? So that, that, that's, that's challenging. One thing we can do, in, instead of working in a continuous fashion in which the, the power can be moved up or down, uh, we can do the discrete control. If you're working at the maximum power point, what you can do, decrease that power in a discrete fashion, in a stepwise fashion, you decrease. You cannot go up, of course, but you can decrease that power. <clears throat> but the, the, the question is there, at what time you should decrease this power? So the work that we're going to do here is to derive conditions, uh, function that can determine the optimal time to make these switches, these changes, because that will be, by just reducing the power in that solar panel, for example, can improve the operation of the system. <coughs> this can be applied to wind turbines, solar panels, <coughs> some energy storage system as well. 
And the, here's the proof of concept. So this idea of discrete control, uh, I had applied this to medium size system to, um, we have a system with 39 buses and this was applied there as well. But here we have a system with nine buses and three generators. Here in the middle of the system, you have three loads. And here, this uh, right, uh, square represent a controllable component. This can be uh, solar panels. This can be a battery, for example. So the discrete control is to change this G, uh, which is the power, from zero to 25. In this case, the, the injection is negative. So actually, I will increase the consumption in a discrete fashion in this bus. But here U is positive. So here I will increase the injection in 25 megawatts. So it's a discrete control. So before that, the powers in, in those squares will be zero. But at some point, I will create the discrete change. The consumption will be increased, the injection will be increased, and then at some other optimal point, I will go back to the original point. So it's just for a short period of time. So as you can see, uh, we have three machines, but I am, for, for the sake of space and, and, and understanding, I put just the result for the one generator. You can see that the system is oscillating and that's negative. We don't wanna have this oscillation in the system. And it's a very significant oscillation. And the system has no other control whatsoever, it's just the discrete control. And at this point, I create the first switching. So this uh, square here will start absorbing power at that time. How much? 25 megawatts. This uh, uh, square will inject 25 uh, megawatt at that point, and that will create a displacement in that oscillation, as you can see. Uh, when you look at the angle and the speed of that generator. But then at this optimal point, 4.81 seconds, I remove that and I go back to the original operating point, which is zero. And as you can see, these oscillation in the machine one are significantly reduced. So if the system is struggling with this, now through the discrete control, we can incorporate components that had not been used in, in, in the past for this type of regulation. So we will have more controllers that in a discrete fashion, they are going to be able to make the system more robust. So that's uh, the last line of research. research. These are some uh, results that we have published in some journals. And I acknowledge the support from NSF and uh, DOE and current, the research centers we have here. And I am open for uh, questions, if you have any questions. So there is a, a question here regarding last example. What would be the result if uh, uh, the controllers continue. If I understand the question is, what would be the result if after connecting the controllers, I, I do not switch them off? Would that be the, the question? Well, if I don't switch them off, I switch, I create the first switching and you have injection and absorption at this point, this will continue. The, during this period of time, the oscillation will not be extinguished. But what we're doing here when we do the first switching, we're putting the system in a new trajectory that will uh, prepare us to make this the disconnection at the optimal point in which the oscillation are almost banished. Okay, there are, I hope that that answers that question. Or if we choose non-discrete controller, yes. If we use continuous controller, is what we have today. But uh, if if we use what we have today, this component that have limited control capability cannot be incorporated in the control actions. So by using discrete control, then we can embrace now a new control action from components that have 
not been included in the past. So that's the, the advantage of discrete control. We should still use continuous controller, of course, but discrete controller will allow us to have more uh, controllers in the system. So that's, that's the idea. Are certain form of renewables, wind, solar, more prone to frequency oscillation than other? The frequency oscillation are basically related to the conventional generators. So you have a hydropower plant, thermal power plant, those are heavy machines. And those are related with the oscillation. So by using solar panels, as I said, if you it's the system need to increase in 10 percent the generation and instead of using the conventional power plant you use solar panels then you are not adding more inertia to the system with the solar panels uh, and that's that's the drawback you 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 can have the same power but you're not adding inertia with wind however because you have blades a turbine that is rotating you have kinetic energy storing the wind. So with wind, if you need to increase 10% of, of the power in the system, you will get some inertia that will be added to the system. So wind will be more beneficial than solar power, power in regards to inertia. Uh, but that inertia that you're adding to the system is not comparable to the inertia you get from conventional power plants. So you're still losing inertia. But wind in that case will be more attractive because you will be able to add some inertia and the system will have some more robustness that can improve the operation of the system. Is there any other question? Does the switching controller refers to set point or point out the coordination of uh, this the switching here uh, will be involved with a collection of comp components that can control can be controlled in a discrete fashion and and when you consider all of them of course you need to have some sort of coordination among the controllers um, game theory involved into this I do not visualize that at the moment um, but that's certainly something that I, I can we can keep talking about uh, if you're cur curious about this. And I hope that I, I, I am able to have results soon. This project started at the beginning of the year. I hope that I have some, some preliminary data, but uh, I started working on this and, and I can share with you if you're interested. I can share with you in the future. If you reach out to me, we can talk about it. Okay, uh, the time is up and I hope this uh, talk was useful for you and you have a better understanding of uh, the, the work that I, I do with my team and how we improve the increase the robustness of the power grid. So the grid is more stable and the grid can take more renewable energy in the future. As there, there is no more question. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Thank you. Thank you.